And Father, we thank you for this opportunity again to be in the house of God. And we ask God that you would sup with us. And we agree with those things that have been said already. As we go forward, keep us from all hurt, harm, and danger through distraction. Help us to yield our members, our ears. May they be inclined into your word. Your word is truth. Give us the ability to comprehend what we hear, understanding and wisdom. Help us to dismiss all distractions. Anything that the enemy might strive to use to distort us. All hindrances, may they come to naught. Speak through us. Speak to us today. We thank you that you are the only one we can turn to. Gracious Lord, you are the creator of the ages. And how that you have chosen us, you love us with an everlasting love. God, give us, O oh God, Give us the way we ought to worship you. Give us, show us the way that we ought to approach you even the more effectively. And we thank you for it now. In the holy name of Jesus. Bless us in our endeavor today. And we give you the praise for it now. And everybody said amen. amen. St. Luke chapter 10 this morning. St. Luke chapter 10. And uh, if you don't have a Bible... I have a few Bibles up here. St. Luke chapter 10. St. Luke chapter 10 today. Today we'll be dealing with uh, several issues, important issues, in this brief discussion amidst a rigid amount of dissertation that Jesus would give in Luke 10. But what we will emphasize on is a very familiar parable, but what precedes that parable, what brings about that parable. I think sometimes we overlook the context of the Bible. Uh, the parables of Christ and how they would correspond, correlate uh, to a specific topic and how through the parable it illustrates the truth to even furthermore nail home a particular subject. And there is within the parables a wellspring of understanding if we were to take the time to smell the roses. One thinks of a garden and how those who have been skilled in landscaping begin to blend in species of plants form they use symmetry uh, sometimes in a rush we can quickly survey it and bypass the difficulty and the time the complexity of which it took the uh, the person the designer to come up with this symmetry and in the Bible, we likewise have symmetry and order that just wasn't thrown there. It's not uh, done by chance. It is directly done by the designer. He has order. And when we stop to look at the roses, smell them, observe the symmetry, I believe you walk away with more value value you appreciate it more or if I were to correspond make it more understandable as it pertains to cooking uh, to make a good turkey if you like turkey at least it takes some time to marinate that booger mm. and that uh, turkeys just don't come out juicy you have to know how to heat the oven up and to of course watch him baste him and uh, it's a beautiful thing when you are blessed with a great meal to understand the time it took to marinate, to simmer, to have everything done accordingly to the ingredients, ingredients to make a perfect dinner. 
perfect dinners are not just made so easily. It takes time. May I share with you that the greatest ingredient to any dinner is not that which Laurie's has to offer, be it seasoned salt or garlic salt, two of my most favorite seasonings, or that which accent has to offer, the enhancement of the flavor, or bay leaves for that matter, or black pepper as we all love it. The greatest ingredient to any dinner is love. If you don't do it in love, my friend, you can taste it in the food. If it's not served in love, you can taste it. And when I look at the beauty of the Word of God, and I, in a poor description, compare it to cooking, compare it to the symmetry of of, of, of the person who does the landscaping I see that they both likewise do it in love they love what they do they show value and appreciation for it and God has given us the greatest revelation of his love by giving us truth truth and it is within these truths today that we seek to derive from it Christian ethics ethics of course, by way of definition, ethics deals with how we conduct ourselves, the proper moral manner that relates to our function in society. Certainly, there are different ethics in the home of a Chinese or those of the Chinese descent as it would be those of the African American uh, uh, descent. But still, they have ethical guidelines by which they uh, rule their life, if you will. But the Christian has a standard that transcends his background. Be it white, be it black, be it Mexican. Because we hold to that moral institution that is founded and laid by God himself. So the highest, if you will, form of morality is found in the Christian world and life view and from that we derive our ethics how we conduct ourselves that we know that there is a God that we believe that he is a judge that he is the origin of all truth justice morals meaning and beauty we see in him a standard by which he holds his vaunted, valued creation too, irrespective of how we may feel. Sometimes we sacrifice ethics for how we may feel. We sacrifice conduct for how we may feel. We sacrifice truth for how we may feel. But God does not give how we feel a pass. This is what you ought to do. This is what that which is right. And he will by no means lower his standard to fit your life. Praise God. He is not some arbitrary judge that gives you a pass. Yes, he has paid for our sins, but he has still and is going to still hold you accountable. For even the word of God says every idle word that men shall speak. So yes, our sins have been forgiven. They have been washed. He has thrown them into the sea of forgetfulness. But how we conduct ourselves, how we live, our motives and intent, He holds us accountable. This is by which He, of course, chastens whom He loves. He corrects them. He rebukes them. Praise God, everybody. And so today, we want to deal with Christian ethics. And we have been for some time discussing this vaguely but today a little bit just if the Lord says the same I pray that I am hearing from him correctly to go in depth a tad bit more as it pertains to how we function in this world as believers Luke is a profound gospel in that he is a man of system He's a great detailer. He accurately, through the grace of God, dispensed unto him 
surveys and does investigative work investigating all the things that we read here. He reports that which he has found to be accurate. And since his gospel really it uh, emphasizes Christ I believe if I'm correct as the son of man the son of man and we find more of Christ's humanity in the sense of his dealings with people and their questions regarding ethics here than any other gospel that's something to think on and what we're going to find today is a very shrewd lawyer a master of understanding the pharisaical interpretation of the law one who is very prestigious prodigious he's up there coming to the master of masters seeking to get a question that Christ had so many times answered but still the animosity that the Pharisees had in striving to catch Jesus in his words as we've already conveyed in times past they are unsatisfied and as I've shared with you before you can give someone an answer but if they don't have ears to hear they can't hear it I liken this to trying to describe the difference between red and orange to a blind man he has no point of reference he has been by birth born blind and no matter how you try to explain the luster of red or the beauty of orange he cannot distinguish between them let alone understand them to see them and this is what the preachers and what ministers do quite often we strive to explain to blind men and women or strive to help them to discern but unless the Holy Spirit comes in and gives us life and opens up the blind eyes we will never be able to see again it's hard to convey reality to someone who cannot see it we often say things when we're discussing this with our friends and family do you see what I'm saying that's a phrase by which we use I guess through poetic license to ask them in essence do you comprehend what I'm saying do you understand what I'm saying and Jesus is going to deal with this man and get straight to the point and begin to give the parable of which we know as the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. I don't know if you've read the Good Samaritan in times past and most likely if you've been saved over five years you have but again we want to camp out through that particular parable today. We want to see what was being said. What did Christ mean by this parable? why was it used again just knowing the parables alone is one thing but to understand the context by which Jesus used these devices to convey truth is another because when you understand the context of the parable it helps you to see the full picture you see the full spectrum of what God was conveying to us and with that it helps you to be more sharp Amen, somebody? Amen. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. When you have it, say, Praise the Lord. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, what is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered, or answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he, speaking of Jesus, said unto him, Thou hast answered right. You've got the right answer. This do, 
and thou shalt live. But he, speaking of the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And I want to use that last response there in 29. Who is my neighbor? My subject again, who is my neighbor? For several weeks now, for some time, the Lord has had this word brewing in the background. And if you're like me and you love iced tea, it tastes better when it's sun-dried, or rather sun-brewed. The longer it sits up, the water heats it in the summer, and it sure enough tastes good. And that which I believe is brewed always seems to have more flavor. And that this particular subject matter has been brewing, I believe it is sufficient now for me to serve it to you. I hope that you brought a thirst today. A thirst to understand how you are to conduct yourself with people. Of those of the household of faith and those who are outside of the faith, sometimes we are guilty of giving one more attention than the other. We become so carried away with doing service in the church that we neglect our duty outside of it as though there is a duty outside of the church. But some have made that dichotomy that we have secular and sacred means of work. That what we do in the church really matters and what we do outside doesn't. It all matters. May I say it that way? And then there's the reverse. We give alms and we participate in hospitality more toward the world and we fail to accommodate and suffice those of the household of faith. And that is unfortunate. It's a lopsided Christianity, may I say it that way. I don't know where you are, I know where I am, and I strive to be equal accordingly and to be just. You read here that there was a certain a lawyer who comes to Jesus asking the age-old question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Of course, we remember someone else who asked this question that we preached about, who was the rich young ruler. What shall I do? Certainly, Jesus addresses the issue there with him more specifically about riches and how that that young man had lacked something in his life and that if he was to give up or rather remove the lack and then he would have eternal life. And what I want to point out first is the fact that when we see the phrase eternal life or in, uh, inherit eternal life, I think the biggest misconception today in modern Christianity is to think that eternal life starts when we're dead. That it's something we receive when we are in the ground is that we will have fellowship with God. But really, specifically, the word and the phrase deals with uh, of the quality of living how you live now eternal life is seen in the quality of life you have now and so certainly it implies everlasting life that doesn't start when you die that starts the moment you say yes to Jesus and he comes in your life and he begins to infuse you with his spirit and so, first of all, in Christian ethics, I don't think that many people have eternal life. Because the quality of life has not changed. There's still the same old them. And if you're still talking the same way you did when you first got saved, and you ain't, you ain't been saved too much, let me say it that way, you probably are stubborn and rebellious. The biggest sin of the church today, again, as I said in times past, is witchcraft. Witchcraft in the form of rebellion. When we rebel against truth, we rebel against being changed. And as this lawyer seeks to justify himself. How many times do we justify ourselves making excuse for what we do? Even at the expense of downplaying or minimizing, devaluing God's word. Here was someone who was well acquainted with the scripture. He was someone that, again, was a master. Which I must say that 
Paul said it well when he said that knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth, love edifieth. Knowledge in the hands of someone who does not have the workings of the Spirit in their life is dangerous. Because the more we know, the more we accumulate. And at times we, we, we build for ourselves our own heaven, our own ethical code of how we ought to deal with God and how we serve Him and how we serve people. The Jews at this time were notorious for interpreting the Word of God to the degree that it suited their lifestyle. Where it, of course, at times was high, but they found a way of accommodating it or reconciling it with their world and their life view. So when we see here that he asks, Jesus asked this man, he says, well, what is written in the commandments? How do you read it? How do you understand it? How do you comprehend it? How do you view it? Certainly he gives the biblical answer, which is to love the Lord thy God with all that is within you and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus is going to call him out on this. But again, Jesus has a tactful way of drawing out of you and I the truth, even when we say we're giving it. I love the Lord thy God. A lot of people love God. They love the Lord. But it's going to be manifested not only in how you serve and worship him, but also how you treat each other. Which have certainly, uh, in modern Christianity, is out the door. We love God and that's enough. And uh, I'm going to tell you, hell will be, well I guess if these people actually slip through the cracks and they get to heaven. Let me reverse that for a moment. If you can't get along with God's people down here, heaven will be hell to you. Huh? I'm not saying that uh, we don't have schisms and contentions within the body of Christ. This is true. But there is a level of forbearance that God will give us to forbear our brothers and sisters. We ain't got to like everything they cook, say, do, eat, wear, or dress, nor the comments they make about us. But there is a certain level of tolerance, forbearance that we will have to, if I use the term put up with them, phrase put up with them for the sake of peace hence Paul says follow peace with all men and when the times come when there can be made there can no peace be made, you just say peace okay my jokes are not going nowhere huh? If we think we have to sit up and tolerate all this kind of, let's just say peace I'm out Yeah. I don't have to sit there and, and endure all of these things because if you remain in that hostile situation, 10 times out of 10 is going to bring the worst out in you. So we have to know when to agree with our adversary and when to depart from him. All right? This, and I'm doing a poor job, I need your prayers. This young man tells him the greatest commandment is to love the Lord. We, we understand that. And to love our neighbor as ourselves. Okay, Jesus, okay, yeah, there you are, do it. But the man willing to justify himself because his view of loving his neighbor had been so marred by misinterpretation, by misapplication, derived from a misunderstanding of the scriptures. Because the Jews at this time looked upon Gentiles as the enemies of God. They looked upon Samaritans as the enemies of God. In fact, if I were to help you to see how they actually... But it's amazing to me how people can come up with all kinds of doctrines that fit their lifestyle to justify um, their wrongdoing. They, they, they strive to do that. And I think it's most, most, most terrible uh, to see Christians when they are confronted with certain choices seek to find the easy way out and what I mean by that I use one that's very vague you know 
when it comes to buying clothes and buying things. They never question if it's God's will to go out and, 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 and get a beautiful new whatever it may be. When it's a sale, they say, oh, God is so good. There's a sale today at my favorite place, and I can go and get what I want to get. But when it comes to paying tithe or when it comes to a need in the church, then they have to say, well, Lord, is it your will that I give this money? But they never question when it's their own selfish ambitions, what I'm trying to share with you. And so to suffice the conscience of what they believe to be true is that God, and it is true that God has enemies, that we will, we will never downplay that, yes. But they went out of their way to interpret the Bible in such a way that it would never cause for them to sacrifice for, for anyone else. So Dr. Lightfoot actually was another theologian, great scholar, wrote on this. He extrapolates out of the Jewish Targums and all of that which would, we would call commentaries. Uh, he surmises it. He paraphrases their belief system. So this is what a Jew believed when it came to dealing with Gentiles and neighbors. Where he said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor. He accepts all Gentiles for... Uh, uh, he accepts all Gentiles for they are not our neighbors but only those who are of our own nation and religion they would not put an Israelite to death for killing a Gentile for he was not a neighbor <laughs> for <laughs> they indeed say that they ought not to kill a Gentile whom they were not at war with but if they saw a Gentile in danger of death they thought themselves under no obligation to help save his life. So if a Jew killed a Gentile, well, we're not going to worry about the Gentile because the Gentile wasn't our neighbor. And if a Gentile was in trouble, we are not obligated to help him because he's not our neighbor. When the young man asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? He's being very sarcastic. Well, who is my neighbor? Who am I to show love to? And to what degree? And I won't deal with the love and the depth of that just yet. But uh, we are guilty at times of having selective neighbors. We think of the neighbor as the person that lives next door to us. And certainly that is a neighbor. But it transcends just that which we live in the local vicinity of your neighborhood. It speaks of all humanity. Because on this earth we're all neighbors. We all live on the same earth. Amen. We're here. And God has placed us here. Which helps us to understand the, the new way of thinking that, uh, and I'm partly guilty of this, of letting the races mix. I think the best argument now to put, if races shouldn't mix, is simply this. If God didn't want us to mix together, he would have put us on different planets. But he put the black man and the white man and the Asian man all within the same area. And so we have a mixture, if there is such a thing as race at least. But the Jews looked at other races with contempt. And it made them feel superior. That they knew God and the Gentiles didn't. So the young man, who is my neighbor? I love God, but who is my neighbor? I love my own. And Jesus will say, if you love your own, what, what reward have you? It's so true how we can be guilty of loving our own. And there is no reward in that, in that sense. Certainly, our alms, we ought not to make boast of when we help someone on the street. Amen. But if we are more concerned with our own and not have any compassion with anybody else I think we've got a problem and this is the context by which Jesus goes into the Samaritan are we there still yeah. you know behind the Samaritan there's so many you heard of the good Samaritan hospital and they went up all across the world Samaritan hospitals and if anyone does anything that's an act of kindness they say oh that's a good Samaritan now let me give you a little bit of background on the Samaritan people. They were people uh, that were mixed breed. And they also had a mixed up religion too. The combination of several 
different forms of idolatry, yet some would hold to the truths of the Abrahamic covenant and the institutions of Moses to some degree. But the Samaritans were people that um, the Jews had no dealings with. And yet Jesus has to, or not should I say, he doesn't have to, he, he, he uses them as a model for how we ought to conduct ourselves. Now, may I share with you, that that's an indictment against the Israelites. To go to someone that doesn't have the richness and the ability to know the law in depthly as the Jews did. Here is someone who vaguely understood the scriptures, who vaguely had the ability to have hands-on knowledge of the word, yet he exhibits more compassion than those who know the truth. Which goes back to what we shared, or at least I'm trying to convey, is that sometimes the world will treat you better than the church. The world has more sense and more love. The, lo the world loves its own. And one thing about the world, they'll accept anybody. It can be two races, black folks out there trying to get a hit. And they'll forget racism for that white man <laughs> who want to get a hit too. And they all put their money together to get a hit. They agree for a high or for a 24 ounce can. They put their differences aside for having like mind common goals. But it's the church. Now let's look here. And Jesus answered and said in verse 30, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And of course this is a very treacherous path, about 17 miles. Steep decline, about 3,000 feet. And it's known for all kinds of havoc. Uh, you wouldn't want to travel on this road unarmed. Because there were men lying in wait. Uh, to catch you at unawares to rob you I don't know the worst place in California now because it's no longer South Central uh, you can go anywhere but we would find that this place would I guess would be like a uh, a, a Tijuana where of course at the border of Mexico and of course um, the American border Tijuana a little small city there and dangerous streets where if you don't have a or have people around you you can end up robbed sometimes kidnapped and held for ransom so I would just want to color that in just a little bit it's not exactly as severe but going down to Jericho or traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho would be very dangerous a certain man went down into Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves they robbed him and if that wasn't enough, they stripped him. So here is a man now robbed. He's stark naked. And uh, stripped him of his raiment, his clothes, and wounded him. And departed, leaving him half dead. These are some vicious rascals that did this. He's beat up. He's badly wounded, he's half dead, and he's stark naked, and he lies on the side of the road. He's in trouble. The Bible says, And by chance there came down a certain priest, which is someone of the clergy, the pastor, the elder, the deacon, the evangelist, the wannabe, whatever the case you want to insert there. Here is someone who holds a high moral standard. A priest. And he was passing that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Here he saw him. He, he, he came up to him and looked. And, and got on the other side. And left. I want to have have the priest ever or the people in the church ever come up on you and see you in a bad fix you can't help yourself they look on you and to avoid you 
they pass on the other side. Now nobody knows because your identification in these times were your clothes. People knew who you were by what clothes you had on. The priest doesn't see anything but a mere man. Doesn't inquire about if he's a Jew or a Gentile. But he sees he's naked and therefore he must be in trouble. And I'm not going to see if he's my brother. Because I don't see any garments that would indicate that he is. And I'm going to leave him to die. Now the word that comes to mind that should come to your mind is wickedness. How wicked that is. For someone to see you half dead, stripped, barely cleaving to life, look at you, and then pass on the other side as if to say, if someone was to ask him, well, I, I didn't even see he was there. Play stupid. This is wickedness. But here is someone, let me tell you about the priest. Here was someone who went to church every week. Here was someone who interceded on the behalf of people. Where was the intercession then? See, let me say this, please. People, some people are quick to say, pray for folks. Pray for them, pray for them. As if prayer is enough. I can't tell you how many times I've came to people being as this uh, this battered man and they say I'm going to pray for you but they have within their power the means to do something as you read James he speaks of how evil and wicked that is and James it speaks about how that faith without works is dead and he goes on to conveyed that truth by saying if your brother is in need and you say hey go be filled be healed be you know uh, let your need me and speak in the name and claim it there and, and you know what are you doing it's evil if you have within your power the means to help somebody the church is good now at praying only but nobody has if you will a convicted conscience to do anything about it and if they do, they have to weigh the options to say if it's God's will or if it's not God's will. God, help us today. When we strive to be so spiritual, we show ourselves to be carnal. Mm -hmm. All right. Come on back. Those who are led by God's Spirit, may I say with this to you. Don't spend too much time rationalizing truth. Mm. Oh, God, help us. Oh, Abraham, how long did you wrestle with getting out of your father's house? The more we rationalize, the more time we allow to elapse, the more procrastination, the more of the, we get out of God's will. You got to move when the spirit move. And now the spirit of God moves and people got to sit up and say, well, wait a minute, let me just make sure about this here. But we hear from God. I'm doing a poor job at this. I'm going to pray for you and that's all I'm going to do for you. In prayer, let me not minimize the need. Thank you for praying. Thank those who pray for you. But if all they got is a prayer, My God. God, help us today. Yes. And so this priest walks by, someone who goes to church every week, who is an intercessor, who is who is not guiltless he sees the man in need but fails because what his world and life view has been distorted he has come to understand and interpret the scriptures in a way it causes for him not to sacrifice or not go beyond that which will inconvenience me You know how much a person loves you by how much they're willing to be inconvenienced by you. Don't tell me, call me anytime. Uh, call me anytime at night. And you call them, I'm asleep. I don't feel like praying. Are you again? 
you find out just how much they, you know, we can speak those great words in the public. You can depend on me as your friend. I'll be there whenever you need. But you really, you find them out over time. Yes, it is. is it true, everybody? Yes, it is. You find out just how far people are willing to go when you are in trouble. And the problem with most Christians today is that they want personal peace. And nobody wants to be inconvenienced. Now, priest, what are you in a rush for? What is so important that you can't take out time to help a soul? Would you have helped him if he had on the robes of royalty? See, the church helps you when they see people help you when they see that there's something in it for them. Huh? Is it true? If you're headed somewhere and if you've been on TV, don't be on TV recently. Oh yeah, they're going to help you real good. <laughs> if they know that you have the potential to reimburse them later. You know how many Christians do things for the sake of being blessed, which is a dangerous thing. If your motive is always being blessed, then doing that which is right is a terrible motive. I think the most dangerous thing people can say that are Christian when they do anything good for someone, I just want to be blessed. Did you do it for the blessing? If you don't have a motive for love, you, you missed your blessing. If you are not motivated through, through compassion and love and, and that which corresponds to the fruit of the Spirit, then your motive is not pure. I mean, if someone gives you something or does something for you only knowing that they want to do this for you because of what you'll do for them, that's evil. And do you know how many people do that to God? They don't pay tithe because they uh, love God. They do because they want to be blessed. And so, don't, you, I'm, I'm going to make some enemies I guess today, but let me make this more plainly. People worship God not because a, a, a large majority of people offer a praise and worship, not because they love God, because they're guilty of saying this cliche. When the blessings go up. When the, when the praises go up. Blessings come down. So we only praise God. Because we want something out of him. No. All right, all right. Whether you bless me or not. Yes. If I give you whatever I give you. And you have no means of re repaying me. I'm not doing it to be repaid. I'm not doing it for a blessing. The church is caught up with these schemes, you see. We do everything based on what we can get. It's a pyramid scheme from Satan himself. People no longer are, are driven to do that which is right. Hear me very moment, for a moment, please. When, when, the, when the first century church got together and they said, oh, well, we want all of y'all to sell something to help, help us okay, disperse a prosperity to all the fellow <laughs> brethren. We know about Ananias Sapphira, right? They sold a possession. They didn't bring what they were supposed to bring. But the church, everybody had got together and we said, we're going to, you know, I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to sell this over here. We're going to all put our money into one pot. What motivated them to do that? I don't give because I want to be blessed. I give because I love God. And beyond that, I want to be that coupled with this I want to see you blessed Amen. if I were in times past to raise an offering can we get five people to give a hundred dollars today I don't know Bridget I don't know. man I got that bill coming up and you know next week Pookie going to be graduating and thus and so but if I said and the Lord is saying if 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 Five people get up right now with a hundred dollars, and by next week you're going to have five hundred dollars. And and the, when the wellspring of heaven will be open, people will be writing out checks, going to get the credit card. Why? Because they're so selfish. They want to be blessed rather than be a blessing. 
do you know how many Christians will stand before God and God try everything they did and find their motives to be impure? Mm. You did it for the wrong reason. You didn't do it as unto me. Sacrifices were not designed, and this is where everybody misses this thing. They were designed to appease God, to satisfy Him. The sacrifice of praise is not designed to set the atmosphere. No, no. This is this is theology that is beyond biblical theology, you see. It's 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 so soulish and humanistic that we now make God, we conform him to as we would a jack-in-the-box that we put a, to put a token in and, and wind him up and then he pops out with a blessing. I don't have a jack-in-the-box God. What I give, I give for his glory, not for my glory. And whether he chooses to exalt me or not, people want today. I'm doing a poor job at this. Pastor, could you pray for my neck? I woke up with it. Pray for me right here. It's, uh, I got to get it healed. Father, we thank you. Thank you. All you got to do to see what I'm telling you is first of all, check your own motives. And everybody you know hollering saved, ask them why they do what they do. As I told you in times past, ask somebody, why do you go to church? Well, I don't want to go to hell. That's the wrong answer. I I don't go to church because I don't want to go to hell. I I don't serve God because I don't want to go to hell. I serve God because I love Him. Well, well, why are you going to church? I want to go to heaven. If there was no heaven, I serve God because I love Him. People have reduced God to you move for him, he moves for you. Wait a minute now. He's in control. Yes, he is. So where now people get mad with the preacher, they don't they don't they don't voice it as they used to. They should. Because they use everything they've done for God as an argument against God. Well, Lord, here, you should hear my prayer because didn't I sell that $500? Didn't I go to church faithful? Didn't I stop having sex? Didn't I stop drinking? And we think that we should be rewarded for what's right? As I tell my children, it is your duty to get good grades. Amen, somebody. How I'm feeling better now. It's your duty. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to do chores. You're supposed to obey. Who am, who, where in the world have we got where we're supposed to be rewarded for everything? And people now rather have the rewards here than over there. Give me my reward over there. Why? Because if I get my reward now, where moth and rust will destroy it. What did he say to do, y'all? He said, lay up for your treasures in heaven. Wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be. The reason why we have so many Christians in love with the world, their heart is with the world. That's their treasure. Their blessings. And if God doesn't preserve that blessing now, they stop coming to church. If God doesn't preserve that marriage or that man who they knew they weren't supposed to marry because he's a sinner. And if God don't keep that sinner in the bed with them, then, oh, I don't want to serve you, God, because, fool, he wasn't the one told you to get married. You did that. (laughs) Baptize our husband, our wife, our whatever. Make it holy and preserve us. And that's how I'm going to serve you. But true, the greatest example of, of perseverance of the saints is seen in, in the book of Job. How I know you have good how how do I know your faith is pure? Is when God uses the devil to strip you of everything. And that doesn't stop there. Get in your health too. Talk to your loved ones. You lose those who are dear to you, his own children. And he still holds on. 
Hear me and mark my words very carefully. The average nincompoop Christian today, if God stripped them of the luxuries of their life, they would not serve God. What was the sin of Israel? They followed after Baal, who was the God of fertility, of agriculture, prosperity. Now God controls the rain. He controls the wind. He controls the ground. And he speaks it if it's going to be prosperous or not. But since they wanted a quicker route that didn't require so much sacrifice, and I don't understand that because Baal required sometimes children, human sacrifice. They'd rather sacrifice their kids than sacrifice their own life. You hear what I'm telling you? Molech, Baal, Ashtaroth were hedonistic gods. Molech specifically had an altar like this here with hands that were underneath it was a, was a, a kiln of fire. And in the hands of Molech, they would place babies into the hands of Molech and the children would be burned alive. Well, well that, that ain't all what they did. Well, let's look at the people of Jericho. To have good luck. Remember the, the walls of Jericho? Yeah. And the wall of Jericho fell down, mm -hmm. right? Well, what were the people of Jericho doing to get good luck? They would bury their children underneath the house alive and build their house on top of dead babies that were smothered to death. They didn't want God. And we see this today in modern Christianity. Since we do not want to be a living sacrifice, we will sacrifice our children. We won't raise them right. <laughs> we won't teach them the ways of God. We'll make money off of them. We'll use them as ploys. Teach them to go in a grocery store and fall down. God help us today. Teach them how to be deceptive. So we can get up in the world and then say, oh, it's God's blessing. I, I, I get offended when I hear Christians get into accidents and then they say, oh, this is God's blessing. And they say, oh, this is a time. I, mean, I, I can't tell you how many Christians I have met that have used illegal and have been liars to get some money. I'm making too much of this, I know, but it's needful. A year ago when I got in that accident, I heard from several preachers, ministers, what I should have did, Pastor James. you hear what I'm telling you? What I should have did. People that I knew, they spoke in somebody's tongue. Three or four people I knew spoke in tongues. What I should have did. Because if I'd have said this and I'd have done that, and if I had played this and did, and I said, you're a Christian. But see, they'll sacrifice to the God of lies to get money in an illegal way shall they escape the judgment of God there will be no one that will escape the judgment of God what you do fraudulent and wicked down here you will see it again because God will weigh your motives and your intent but if I get back to this priest now how dare this priest someone who's known for walking around I hope not in a prideful way because they were servants of God. You couldn't get no higher than a priest unless you were a prophet. Someone who worked exclusively under God's direction. Who inherited this job. This job was not something you can go and apply for. You had to be of the lineage of Aaron himself. And how far his heart was from his father Aaron. Are you that busy that you can't help nobody else? Are we are that busy that we're, we don't want to be inconvenienced? A lot of things inconvenient. Let me give you three things I think I think would suffice. People do not want to be inconvenienced with their time. I'll give you two. <laughs> what do you think the, the, the second thing is? Oh, money. If I give you this, it's going to, I can't pay my cable bill. If I give you this, I won't be able to go and get or do and that. Nobody wants to be inconvenienced. 
Hmm. But I have found something in the Bible. Something by way of looking plainly and systematically. And that is this, if you haven't got tired. And that is those whom God has used the most have been those who have been inconvenienced. <sighs> Nehemiah, is it convenient for you to travel a thousand miles to go and build the walls? Ezekiel, is it convenient for you to leave your wife now? And she's passed away and not shed a tear. Moses, is it convenient for you now to leave your wife too? For 40 days, sometimes 80 days. To be in God's God uses those who are willing to be inconvenienced. Because there's something about being inconvenienced with, with God. It is convenient to be in His presence. And when you truly are in love with God, there is no such thing as inconvenience. Because you see it as total obligation. It's, it's a mandate. The problem with the church today, people see it as an option. It's an option to serve God, an option to be at church, an option to give. And we can choose how we feel today, what we're going to do. God, help us with this option Christianity. Well, I don't choose that. I choose to serve God with all my heart. Not because of a blessing. I would serve God if I had no reward. And I, I guarantee you, I don't have very many rewards if there be any up there. I don't serve him based upon a future paycheck. If you serve God only because you want to miss hell and gain heaven and have wings to fly, then I would tell you that's, 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 that's an insult to knowing the greatest thing about heaven is being glorified and to be in the presence of the Almighty for eternity. I want him. Keep the blessings. You can take mine because I, I, I won't have time to really be flying. I, that sounds great to the carnal mind. But that's irrelevant to see God. While y'all busy walking around the golden streets, praise God. God bless you, but I'm going to be at the feet of my maker. And may God you hold me to it. I can't see anything more exciting than that. Yeah. Jennifer has traveled the world. Germany, huh? Most of all of 50 states. A lot of exciting places. A lot of places I think are exciting here. But nothing in comparison. Yes, mama, grandmama, big mama, cousin Pookie, who by the grace of God was saved. God bless you. I'm glad you made it. But let me go see the one that made me. And I can tell the angels scoot over. Let me sing the hymn too. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. Oh, that's a song I won't get tired of singing. Because to see what they see, I guarantee you we won't get tired of singing the same song for eternity. Now, the priest passed him by. Has, has the priest ever passed you by? Have the people in the church ever passed you by? You moaned! Oh! If you had any strength to moan loudly. <sighs> and they don't take the time to see if you're alright. That's a hurtful thing. As I mentioned before, church hurt is the worst hurt. And sometimes the church is at times guilty of adding insult to injury. Because he was injured by the world and the church did not help him. And that, may I say, is another gross sin of the church. Because the people coming out of the world have likewise been battered. They've been stripped. They've been stark naked. They're dead. And the church passes them by. Because they don't see any potential. Or because they don't feel a certain way. 
The next person to pass by this man is likewise of the same sort. And likewise a Levite. Here is someone who is not a priest but still is a part of the Levitical tribe. When he was at the place, came, here he is, and looked on him. Again, here's someone else, came and looked on him. These are two men. The priest and the Levite are two great men in the world of jewelry. <laughs> but yet, they would not help this man. Now there's a word that comes to my mind, hopefully you can agree with me, how heartless this is. Heartless. They wag their heads and they go out of their way to go on the other side of the road as again, if to say we didn't even see him there. Heartless men. And he's dying. But a certain Samaritan now, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, pity on him. Which, okay, we must concede this is carnal and not spiritually motivated, but still, it reveals some essence of the fallen nature of man retaining just a tad bit of that which God has caused for us to have. He feels something for him. And when I see this here, I think it's quite interesting that he is, first of all, again, a Samaritan. And he's journeying too. Now, a Samaritan is not a priest. He's not a Levite. And he's sure enough ain't a full-bred Jew. It is believed that Samaritans, as they took this road, they were always on business endeavors. But wherever he was going, he wouldn't get there on time today. Notice that the Samaritan was willing to be inconvenienced. Notice that the Samaritan was willing not only to pay for this man to stay in the, in, in the Motel 6, but also give two days worth of wages to make sure this stranger was okay. He takes this man, he bandages him up, he pours oil and wine in his womb, puts him on his own colt, his own donkey, and transports him. Oh, what a Samaritan! The world beats the church! The world is more faithful to do the works than the church do. Well, Mr. Samaritan, if you don't hurry up and get on out of here, you're going to miss that meeting. Hey, this is more important. I don't know this man, and most likely... Uh, if, if I were in the same shoes, I doubt he would help me. But, 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 but I'm not going to let no man die on my watch. Why? Because he is created in God's image. This is what Jesus was driving home here, you see. That although we may be of different races and creeds, tongues, all men were created in God's image which says this that all men have value meaning they have purpose and when we fail to see although that sinner who is wicked and profane is still created in God's image if we don't recognize that I doubt we'll have any humanitarian act going to be worked through us now, I'm glad that this man had a bit of modicum of understanding this. Had he been like those of the past, Darwin, he would have said, survival of the fittest. You couldn't put up a good fight to hang in there and beat the people down who got you. You deserve to be killed. As Hitler in his Third Reich went on to slaughter untold millions, believing in a superior race, of strong athletic geniuses. 
if this man's worldview, the Samaritan worldview, if, if, if he was a Buddhist, or more specifically, the foundation of Buddhism is Hinduism. Hinduism teaches that if someone is in a rut, they deserve to be there because in a former life they once were evil or bad, and they're getting what's just due. And to help them is to help someone who deserves punishment, and therefore you, upon yourself, will likewise have to suffer because you helped them and you shouldn't have helped them. That's why Hinduism doesn't build orphanage or hospitals. They don't do that. Do you know that Christianity, this is amazing to think about, is the only belief system that institutes humanitarian acts of kindness. When the Christians went over during the campaign of the British into India and they set up schools and hospitals, the British are like, what in the world are y'all doing? They had never seen hospitality. Because if you're born poor over there, you deserve to be poor because maybe in the last life you were a bad person or a bad dog or even a bad carrot. God help us, how can you be a bad carrot? And to see them show acts of hospitality, of compassion, of love. Saying, we want that God that you have because that's a, that's a good God. That, that kind of God is a God of love. Atheism builds no hospitals. Atheism builds uh, no, no, no place for children, no, no aid for people. If that Samaritan had the Hinduistic belief system, he would have never stopped to help that man. But we must agree that he had some understanding to see the value. When I hear people say that we are just higher life forms, we're all mammals, and that we come from dogs, I've never seen no one on the freeway slam on their brakes when they see a dead dog and say let's investigate who killed this dog or stop and say let's have a vigil for a dog because they know that that dog is a dog it has no value of life as we human beings that thing is not related to me we come from monkeys go tell the monkeys we come from monkeys see how, and how they'll be insulted by that they'll be insulted by that they don't want to be no human. They are what they are. The Samaritan sees that this man is a man. And does all within his ability to resurrect, restore, and bring this man into a place where he can function again at his own cost. Well, now if I take this another way to close. The scripture says that Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. See, Satan met this man who we don't know on that road to Jerusalem. He stole from him. He's tried to kill, to destroy him. But along comes a Samaritan that picks him up when the religious world says no. Mm. Ah, I'm talking about Jesus oh, yeah. over here. Come on, yeah. Jesus sees him and begins to bandage his wounds. Mm. Pouring in oil and wine. No, he pours in his own blood. My God. Oh, hallelujah! Places him upon the beast and he carries him to a place that he can be healed and pays the expense. Who is your neighbor, you say? Young man, you arrogant young man who try to justify the people you should help and who you shouldn't help. <laughs> who was a neighbor unto him? And the young man has to concede that the Samaritan was a neighbor. Because he showed compassion. He was willing to be inconvenienced. He was willing to go the extra mile. He was willing to do something and not see anything in return. God help us today. The average Christian will say yes. When the man wakes up, tell him this is my name and phone number. And when he gets back on his feet, come back and repay me. 
God help us that, that people strive and they live off of the accomplishments they've had. I seek not to exploit anybody or to exploit what prophecies do come to pass. If I can be a help, then you give God the glory. But let's say, I don't know how this story went, but listen here. What if, what if, that, that, and as I believe, that man came back to being fully functional, that Jew who was broke and busted and disgusted, and he says, who, who was it that helped me? Oh, there was a, Sam a Samaritan did what? I would have never did that. But he tracks down that Samaritan. And the Samaritan tells him, give glory to God. You be careful about taking glory that is exclusively for God. See, what the Samaritan recognized, what we fail to recognize, is that on that road, it could have been me. What the Lord failed to recognize, I'm trying to say. Anyone is subject to being robbed. Anyone is subject to being in a hard place. And I suppose that Jew probably always thought, if, if ever I get down, my family going to be there. If ever I get down, the church going to be there. But God raised up somebody who he least expected. Is it true? I'm sure that devout Jew who was robbed just knew his brothers would not turn their back on him. Just knew that the church would always be there. But did not he learn a great lesson? That the church will only be there when I'm in good standing in their eyes. When I have something to offer. Is it true? Churches will roll out the red carpet when there's someone with a lot of money. A lot of ingenuity. But when they long, no longer see your potential, who are you? The Samaritan doesn't care if the man was, was from Timbuktu. Hallelujah! And teaches this lawyer, Jesus does, a most valuable lesson about honoring God by showing that you love him and how you deal with people. Don't tell me you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and don't have love for your neighbor. As John would even go further and speak about it if you have love for the, don't have love for the brethren. The love of God is not in you. Yes, they may do wrong, but you have some love for them. They may be, you have some kind of love for them. Love to get away from them. Love to correct them. That's right. Love to love them from a distance. Yes, we've got to define that too. But nevertheless, here is a prime example of true Christian ethics that chagrins this lawyer where he has to concede the Samaritan was the neighbor. Now, how many good Samaritans we got in the church today? Don't raise your hand. But how many are willing to say, I want to be a blessed saint rather than be blessed? And then we have people to say, well, you, you got to be blessed to be a blessing. And I understand how that, what they mean by that. But let's get to this more in the latter. That whether you get recognized for your alms or not, you're not any for recognition. Why does he say, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing? Don't look for man to exalt you. Look for God to do it. And even if he never exalts you, do it with the mind because you love him. This is what separates the thirsty, hungry Christian from the serving Christian that's humble. How we respond why we give, why we come to church, how all that, how we live determines your world and life view when it comes to Christ. Father, we thank you for your word today. And I pray that something was said.
And although it is a hard word to chew on, may we swallow it, God. May we digest it. May we ingest it. That you might get down into us and teach us how to conduct ourselves. How when we worship you, it should be based upon love alone. Not infused with what we want to tell you. How we should not rush into prayer to tell you all the things we want. And that happens so often, Lord. We start out our prayer saying, Lord, we love you. We thank you how good you are. Then we get quick to listing all the things we want from you. So we use love as a primer to get you to smile on us. And then when you smile, we're ready to just start asking you what we tell you what we want. Oh God, may we not do you that way, Lord. May we love and pray to you. And not worry about how inconvenienced it is if our favorite show is turned off or goes off. Or if we pray through lunch or pray through dinner. Come on, Lord. May you, Lord God, temper our hearts to serve you. And everybody said in Jesus' name, amen. Somebody say praise God.